little intro uh, and I'll direct my attention now. I'm going to start ignoring you, Josh, for the moment. Sure. I'll direct my attention to anyone else who may be watching. Uh, hi, I'm Bill Graben with. Um, excuse me. Uh, can you hear me adequately, Josh? I can hear you. It, it, uh, right when you were saying your name, I think it uh, it blanked out on me, but okay. everything else has been clear. Okay, good. I'm <laughs> Bill Graben with York County Audubon. Uh, we're on behalf of our board and also on behalf of Maine Audubon, of which we are a chapter, a proud chapter. Uh, we're happy to welcome you here tonight. Uh, normally, as most of you know, We've had our programs at the Wells Reserve at Laud Home, uh, a fabulous uh, organization, facility, and property. If you're not familiar with it, uh, we certainly encourage you to check it out. It's in Wells, Maine, 2,200 acres, uh, miles of trails, uh, tremendously varied habitat, a great place to go any time of year. Uh, tonight, we're joining you uh, via Zoom, or actually, yeah, it is Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> this app that we're employing. And uh, our program tonight is entitled 23 Reasons to Go Outside. And our presenter is uh, Josh Fecto from uh, a local naturalist, a very dedicated and diverse naturalist. Uh, you could say he's kind of a Renaissance naturalist in that his, he is, his interests are quite varied. Uh, a lot of people who are birders in Maine know him as someone who uh, three years ago set a Maine state record um, for a Maine big year, which for those of you who are not familiar with it, it means uh, an attempt to see uh, as many species as you can within one calendar year. And Josh uh, managed to see 317 species, uh, which set a new record. I'm not sure if that record is still the current one or if it has been surpassed. I'll, I'll defer to Josh to update the status of that. Yeah. Uh, but it was quite impressive. And uh, so he's very knowledgeable about birds throughout the state, both the ones that are normally here as well, as well as ones that sometimes just show up unexpectedly. Hmm. Another of his uh, focus areas is edible plants, wild edible plants, native ones in particular. Uh, he's taught many programs and workshops on this. Again, uh, tremendously knowledgeable. And he has a blog, joshfecto.com, uh, on which he describes and presents uh, quite a few more than 23 reasons to go outside. <laughs> so we encourage you to check that out as well. And uh, with that, Josh, it's all yours to give us some good reasons to go outside. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Bill. So let's, um, I guess I should jump and make sure I can start my sharing my presentation here. Let's see. I think I know how to do this. We're going to click this button. All right. Is that coming through for everybody? All right. Probably everyone else is in mute. I don't know. Let me. <laughs> yeah. All right. So here we go. So 23 Reasons to Go Outside. My name is Josh Fecto, as Bill said, and thank you for the great introduction. And thank you um, for all the promotion and, and, and for putting this uh, program together. I know several of the local papers carried a little blurb about this, and hopefully maybe that's some, some, uh, how some of you found out about it. Um, so we're just a couple minutes after seven. I know Probably people might still be filtering in, but we're just gonna we're just gonna go for it here. Um, I can get my presentation to click. Here we go. So, first slide. I just want to run through my objectives here. Um, first one is to show lots of photos. Um, 
that should be pretty easy since I made the slideshow. Uh, um, and the, the, the purpose of the big purpose of the talk is to hopefully share with you some, some excellent search images um, to, uh, you know, get your brain working in the background. Um, because when you, sometimes you need to see things multiple times before you can recognize them for yourself. Um, and so hopefully this presentation will open some doors for you in that way. And maybe a few days or weeks or months from now, uh, you might uh, come upon something in your travels and say, wait a second, I think I, I think I might know what that is. Um, so hopefully we'll plant some seeds. Um, two, I want to spark curiosity. Um, a lot of us probably care a lot about birds. Um, I know I do. Um, and certainly, you know, for York County Audubon, birds are, are the main story. Um, but there's a lot of other cool stuff going on uh, in our neighborhoods. Um, and I'm hoping to introduce you to some of the other characters um, that we share um, this space with. So we'll, we'll give you a, a, a bit of a sampler. I, you know, we won't be able to sample all the areas there are of interest, but hopefully some and some that might catch your eye. Um, and finally, I wanna save some time for questions. So uh, we're gonna aim to wrap my presentation up around eight o'clock. Um, and if you have questions, please type them into the um, Q&A box, uh, which you should find at the bottom of your screen or somewhere in your Zoom app. And Nick or Bill uh, will be sort of curating the questions. And at the end, we will try to answer as many as we can or as I can. All right, so let's go for it. Reason number one. So reason number one to go outside. Uh, if you've never seen these before, these are black trumpet mushrooms. Um, and black trumpets are just, uh, they're just fantastic. Uh, yes, they're edible, but uh, even edibility aside, they're just super cool. Um, they're these, you know, sort of hollow vase shaped um, mushrooms that when they pop out, and you know, depending on the year, depending on the rain, um, depending on the situation, they can just be prolific, and and they're just so fun. And they can be really hard to see if you've never seen them before, and if you don't quite know what you're looking for. Um, I say some strategies for finding black trumpets are to maybe bring some small uh, people with you, as in uh, children, um, who uh, are lower to the ground because they have uh, some advantages when it comes to noticing these um, short mushrooms that just pop up from the soil. Um, and, uh, you know, when you do get to meet these black trumpets, you know, give them a good smell um, and just enjoy these mushrooms. Now, unlike uh, sort of traditional, a lot of typical mushrooms that you think of, um, they don't have gills. Um, and they don't have, you know, they're not polypores, they don't have pores, they, they just have sort of these very subtle ridges on the outside of, of the fruiting body, uh, where the spores are released. Um, they're just, they're kind of a bizarre uh, relative of chanterelles. And they're just these really cool mushrooms. So there's one shot here's another shot of they can be a bit more on the pale side and part of that might just be my photo as well making it look a little paler but it gives you a better look at the at the ridges uh, on the sort of bumpy outside and there's another look as one really tiny one and then uh, a larger one black trumpets reason number two um, if any of you caught uh, the beginning uh, when Bill and I were just talking, um, I said uh, right before, uh, just five minutes before I came onto the Zoom call, uh, I was hearing a barred owl calling outside my house. And uh, this summer, I've been lucky enough to hear uh, one of these guys, or a couple, a couple of them, uh, which are juvenile barred, owl, barred owls. So this is actually a juvenile uh, barred owl. Um, this one I found. Uh, because it was calling uh, during the daytime and uh, they make a bizarre sound that can fool a lot of people and I, I'm not really good at mimicking them but it's like this and 
sort of a sound, uh, sort of a shrieking sound. It can be a little bit uh, scary if it's really close to you. You're like, what is making that sound? Who is making that sound, as I like to say? Um, and uh, barn owls with their black eyes. Here's an adult uh, barn owl, their yellow bill, and those just black eyes. Really cool. One of our resident owls, um, and uh, certainly have some nesting in the woods around my home. Uh, this was a couple winters ago. I got to watch one eating snow. Um, it just so happened I was uh, I was hanging out near a bird feeder. I was watching watching you know chickadees and nuthatches and uh, titmice coming to a bird feeder. And this, and then I just happened to look up in a certain place, and a barred owl was just sitting, sitting on this branch, and I was able to watch him for quite a while. And and while I was watching him, he just started, uh, started chowing down on the snow, which I thought was was pretty interesting. It was snowing at the time, and he was obviously a bit thirsty. Um, and here's just another another shot of an adult barred owl. obviously also in the winter. Here's reason number three, uh, Allegheny mound ants. So uh, in New England, as far as I know, there's only one species of ant that makes mounds of this size. So we're talking like two or three feet um, in diameter, uh, can be quite sizable mounds. This is one example. Um, here's an, a, a spot I found um, in, a, in a clearing in a wooded area that had a variety of mounds, some very old and covered with moss uh, and some uh, fresh um, and at different stages of, of, um, of construction, I guess. Um, and uh, pretty neat to see a, a whole collection of uh, ant mounds. Here's one I found really close to my house uh, this spring. And I'm not sure why I hadn't done it before, but uh, I recommend if you can uh, take a close look because um, I had never really looked at an Allegheny mound ant, but uh, here are some. And they have this you know, red and black uh, black body, and if you look even closer, you can see they have very cool little tails on their on their. Uh, I'm not even sure what kind of body part. I'm not an entomologist, but um, anyway, I just think they're really cool. So I, I encourage you to uh, take a look at them up close if you get the chance. Um, and these guys were busy, you know. They're uh, communal livers, uh, and uh, they they've got a lot of work to do. Reason number four, this is another hyper-local one. So I happen to have a little stream that crosses in front of our house. Uh, and one day, um, I, can't, I don't know when it was, maybe in February, um, there was all of this ice um, that had formed. And, oh, 10 hours later, uh, probably even just five or six hours later, it was all gone. But boy, when I went out and saw this, it was magical. Actually, I think I have to give Jenny the credit for spotting these, but um, check out these things. They just looked like jewelry uh, for the stream. Um, just, and, and, and they were sort of, um, I can't capture the, mo the motion in these pictures, but you get the sense that they were uh, swinging slightly. These, these just amazing, ice formations and icicles with the stream running underneath them. Very cool. Coming right off the moss. So pay attention to ice. It can do some amazing things, although it, uh, it may not always last very long. Here's reason number five. Uh, and one that if you live in Maine or in New England, um, in May and June, if you spend time in New England in May and June, you undoubtedly have heard this bird sing. Uh, oven birds are very vocal, very loud, um, 
warblers. They're a type of warbler that uh, spends a lot of time on the ground. They, they walk around in the leaf litter and, and find their food that way. Um, but the males will also perch up sometimes quite high in trees and sing very loudly. And um, so here's a shot of an oven bird and uh, another photo will be able to see his uh, orange crown stripe, which is a, one of their cool features. But this is a cool thing. I, I, I've only had an opportunity to find one of these maybe once or twice. Um, and really not when I, I really wasn't looking for it, but uh, this is a nest of an oven bird and they uh, I think their name is a reference to their nest, which is uh, this dome shaped nest with a side entrance that they build on the ground um, out of woven grasses. And uh, here's a close up of uh, the nest with the eggs inside. And here's a shot of a male singing. And you can maybe just get a hint of the orange crown stripe. And here's a little better look, although the, I think the crown stripe is somewhat controlled by their um, posture and, and whether they want to sort of flash it at you or not. So this guy, I think, was in somewhat of a more relaxed pose. So we don't get a, a brilliant flash of orange. But, um, but you get a good sense in this photo of the sort of chevron-shaped um, markings on the chest. Um, and this is just a, a really common, um, frequently heard bird, teacher, 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 teacher. Um, very cool. Reason number six, birch polypore. Uh, here's a, another mushroom for you. Um, and this is a, a really young birch polypore that has just busted its way out, uh, out through the bark of, of a birch tree. Um, and I just imagine the force um, that these creatures have as they're, as they're, um, as they're emerging. Um, here's some older, um, older birch polypores, sort of a top-down view. This is in the winter time on a on a gray birch. Um, as far as I know, they may grow occasionally on other species, but as far as I know, it's they're pretty much specialists on birch trees. So if you want to find birch polypore, you gotta you gotta find birch trees first. Um, here's a shot from below, looking up, and you can see the the pore surface. So uh, these guys also don't have gills. Instead, they have uh, sort of an undersurface with very fine, like pin prick size little holes where the spores um, uh, are where the spores come out um, which is how they reproduce um, so sometimes this mushroom can be quite prolific on trees um, you can find many 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 um, and typically they're going to be found on, on trees that are either dead or dying um, Oh, and I want to say also about birch polypore is um, I can't talk specifically about it, but I can say that um, this mushroom is um, a well-established uh, medicinal mushroom. And of course, there are many medicinal mushrooms um, that are in our woods um, that can be utilized for a variety of, of, of issues. Um, namely for uh, supporting the immune system. And so if that's something of interest, um, you might follow up with some additional research on that topic. Reason number seven, uh, lichens. And th this is sort of like, imagine if I, reason number seven is like birds, like it's kind of a general topic. Uh, lichens are, are a there's a lot of different kinds of lichens and lichens are tricky, especially for people who are used to, you know, identifying a bird or a butterfly. That's a pretty straightforward process, identifying a tree, but identifying lichen um, is tricky. Uh, resources for that are often lacking because they require uh, often, you know, the use of a microscope or using certain chemicals to see how they react with the, with the lichen, and, you know, if you mix this chemical and you get a certain color, that can help you identify it. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit tricky of a thing, but that doesn't prevent you from enjoying them and from noticing them and from uh, taking a close look at them. So here's a lichen that I found growing uh, specifically on black locust trees. Um, there's 
for some reason, I, I find this particular, and I, I really don't know what kind this is, um, but I find it often growing on black locust trees. So they seem to have somewhat of a partnership. Here's a, a closer view of this lichen, and we see some of the reproductive parts, these uh, sort of saucer-shaped, um, darker gray. I'm not, I'm not a lichenologist either, but uh, just fascinating and if you spend some time paying attention to tree bark, which is just one of the places where you can find lichen, you can also find lichen on the ground, on rocks, on bricks, you know, all sorts of places. Um, but just pay attention to lichen on trees and you'll, you'll find that there are many, many kinds and many, many colors. And here's just another even closer view of this cool lichen that I, that I uh, am particularly drawn to for some reason on these black locust trees. I just find it really, really stunning. Reason number eight, black locust flowers, speaking of black locusts. So in the right season, which is pretty much gonna be early June in Maine, um, and give or take if you're in far Northern Maine or if you're in Southern New England, it might be a tad earlier, uh, late, late May, very beginning of June. Um, is the flowers of black locusts are edible. And this is kind of a, maybe just a touch early, but I'm, I'm looking for flowers that are like this or when they first open. If you wait too long, I find they get uh, a bit too flowery tasting for me, a little strong uh, perfumey almost. But, uh, but at this stage, they're, they're quite nice to, uh, to just eat. Uh, you can like pick the whole cluster. It's almost like a cluster of grapes and obviously they don't taste sweet like grapes, but they're, um, they're nice. If you've never tried them, I recommend uh, trying to find some black locusts for next year. Reason number nine, Luna moths. Now this is one I wish I had I wish I've seen more of these in my lifetime. Hopefully I get to see some more. Um, this is one I happen to notice uh, going to work one day. It was uh, just sitting on the building uh, that I was about to walk into to start my work day. And there was a, a Luna moth just hanging out. And this one was a little tattered. They only live for uh, seven to 10 days as an adult. So in, in this form, um, and this one maybe, I'm not sure what day it was, probably wasn't his first or second day based on the, the wear of, of this creature. So maybe getting towards the end of his lifespan. Um, but such a fascinating creature. And the, these, these sort of false eyes that um, I think are there to sort of uh, baffle predators, that <laughs> sort of looks like a creature with eyes looking at you. It's uh, pretty fantastic. Here's a close-up of him sort of looking right at you. Although I, I'm not really sure where his eyes are, but <laughs> pretty amazing creature. Reason number 10, Eastern coyotes. So coyotes uh, might scare some people, uh, but they're also really cool. Um, we've got, you know, wild canines uh, living in and amongst, uh, uh, you know, our neighborhoods. Um, this is one that I spotted. Uh, I was driving to work and saw one near the edge uh, of the road and he ended up crossing the road right in front of me and I was able to snap this picture. On a different day, um, uh, Jenny was with me. We were driving somewhere uh, really not far from home, maybe a half a mile from home. And we saw a mammal cross the street and we said, huh, wait a second. <laughs> was that a coyote? And we were a bit far away, um, but we were able to uh, slow down and look closely into the woods. And yes, indeed, it was actually two coyotes. And I was able to photograph one of them reasonably well um, while she looked back at us. And uh, I was able to, you know, photograph her tracks in the road, which I showed in the last slide. Um, but coyotes are uh, often really hard to see. Hard, you know, they're uh, but they're but they're they're living their lives uh, right around us. And um, maybe like with a lot of other creatures, 
we maybe hear them more than we see them. Um, I've certainly heard heard them howling many a nights, um, but it's neat to occasionally get a glimpse. Reason number eleven: liverworts. And this is sort of like lichens. It's a it's a big topic that. Um, one could probably dedicate uh, a couple years towards even uh, getting a cursory understanding of what liverworts are about. Um, and at a glance, you might just say, oh, it's another type of lichen on a tree, but, um, but it's not. This is, a, this is a, a liverwort, which is a, a plant. So uh, lichens are actually um, a combination organism they're often, uh, it's a fungus that partners with um, a bacteria or a cyanobacteria, or, sorry, an alga or a cyanobacteria. And uh, they're able to, to work together to, you know, to, to live and, and propagate. Um, liverworts, on the other hand, are, are plants. They're very sort of simple plants in terms of um, their structure and minimalists, if you might, you might call them. And uh, let's take a closer look. You know, these guys, it sort of looks like just miniature, tiny little leaves, overlapping leaves. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I wish I knew more about uh, liverworts. I've, I found it challenging to learn much about them because uh, it seems to be a topic that um, uh, it's hard for lay people to access much about liverworts, I think. Um, but they're all around us, I realized. Um, there's lots of different kinds of liverworts. They're often said to be associated with wet areas, with stream sides and, and things of that nature. But I've noticed um, this particular kind, and, and maybe there's multiple species here, um, but this kind that appears to grow on tree bark has sort of caught my attention in recent years. And so here's an example of sort of what it looks like when things are fairly humid. They seem to have a this sort of structure. Then uh, recently I took this picture, which the uh, same kind of structure, but you can see this one looks almost a bit desiccated. And um, I think that's uh, just the nature of how dry it's been that they're sort of, they're waiting for some moisture to return. So here's another shot. And this is one growing on um, yellow birch or silver birch. Um, so I, I encourage you to, to check around the trees near you and see if you can't find some liverworts. And you may, you may very well find trees with liverworts and lichens um, right next to each other, but see if you can notice the difference and get up real close and just look for their, that fine little like overlapping leaf pattern and these sort of meandering um, pattern. It's, it's a pretty fascinating creature. Reason number 12, solitary sandpiper. Sandpipers. Um, so, solitary sandpiper. We were talking a bit about shorebird migration, and solitary sandpipers are maybe one of the first shorebirds that I remember when I was uh, be first becoming a birder um, when I was living back in Massachusetts. And I didn't live particularly close to the coast. Um, I would occasionally get there, but um, primarily I was birding right about right around my house. Um, you know, within a, a mile or two biking distance. And one of the reliable uh, shorebirds that I could encounter um, away from the coast was solitary sandpiper. And I would find them sometimes in just these very small puddles. Um, I'd just be riding my bike through the woods and, or, or like along a power line cut or something. And there would be, a, you know, a little, a little puddle. And I would spook a bird and it took me a while, you know, maybe the next day I would go by, I would go by that same spot, but instead of biking right through it, I would stop before I got there and slowly approach and then scan with binoculars. Um, and I would be able to see the bird before he flushed. And I was eventually able to, uh, to identify um, that I was spooking solitary sandpipers. So they uh, they, they often are solitary. They're, they're fascinating birds. They have sort of these uh, yellow-green legs, that nice white eye ring, speckled back, sort of medium-length bill. And a little secret, 
is that they're not always solitary. So this picture shows three of them, a nice little triangle of them. And sometimes you can find several in the right habitat, but often, often uh, you will just find one or two. They, they kind of, they don't flock together in giant flocks like the way that you see some birds at the coast, some of the shorebirds that will just be like 300 birds in a, in a cloud and be wheeling around in the air. Um, these guys definitely have a different strategy of uh, social distancing, perhaps. Here's another look. Uh, this one, I believe I photographed in Wells. Um, was able to get really close to this bird for whatever reason, he allowed me to, to come quite close. Um, a really good look at the, the white eye ring. Reason number 13. This is a cool one. I, I'm sort of interested in insects a little more these days and, and uh, spotted this creature uh, or the, remain, the sign of this creature um, last winter, uh, pine tube moth. And the larva of a pine tube moth, um, sort of caterpillar-like creature um, that creates uh, sort of glues together or weaves together with silk or something, uh, makes these little tubes out of pine needles, sort of cuts, cuts them off. Um, trims them somewhat and makes this nice little hole, uh, my, nice little shelter for itself uh, in the pine needles. And if you look around enough, uh, you might find these, you might find several or, or hundreds even uh, in certain trees. So I would encourage you if you have some white pines uh, near you, take a look and see if you can't find some pine tube moths. I find it, it's a good activity for winter time when you're uh, looking for something to do. Um, but really any time of year, you might be able to find uh, some signs of, of this creature. Um, I think the, the adult moth is pretty easy to miss, a very small creature. Um, but the uh, sign that the larva leaves behind, these little, these little tubes, Kind of fascinating. Be neat to make my own little house out of pine needles, right? <laughs> uh, reason number 14, uh, Eastern Spicy Wintergreen. This, this is a plant with many names. Uh, you might know it by other names, like maybe just wintergreen or uh, checkerberry or teaberry. I like to call it Eastern Spicy Wintergreen. Um, that's one of what yeah, anyway, <laughs> common names are funny. Uh, Gaultheria procumbens is the, the uh, scientific name if you're interested. Um, this plant is quite common around me, maybe it is near you. Um, has these kind of almost uh, waxy, thick leaves. And if you taste them, and I typically don't eat them because they're, the texture isn't really such that you want to uh, swallow it. But, um, but if you just sort of have it in your mouth and, and sort of bruise it uh, a bit, you get a, a really nice wintergreen flavor from it, a little, a little breath mint. Um, this is a look at the flowers of uh, Eastern spicy wintergreen that come out in the summertime and they lead to a fruit that looks uh, like this, this red fruit. And these are also edible. And I certainly don't go out uh, collecting them the way I might collect uh, blueberries, but um, the occasional trail nibble, as they say, um, certainly uh, worthy of, of a taste um, on occasion. I recommend them. If you haven't tried them, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Reason number 15, I'll give you a second. See if you can see this guy. A little hard to see where he is, but he's right in front of you. The European mantis. Talk about camouflage on this plant. Um, this was a, uh, towards the end of fall, this is a, a goldenrod that is starting to die back. And this creature just totally blends in. So here's another look at this uh, European mantis. And there's some other mantises around, um, uh, the Chinese mantis, European mantis. There may be some, some native mantises, but I think they're, they're less common near us. 
Um, but this guy, uh, for identification purposes, um, look for that black uh, surrounding that white spot in his sort of armpit. And that uh, tells us it's a European mantis. And that is just a talk about camouflage and stealth, um, an amazing uh, sort of part plant, part insect. Really cool. And I, I recommend it, <laughs> for finding them, if, uh, if you don't uh, know where to look, I, I would say old fields um, and maybe again, employ the help of a child. Um, they seem to have uh, the ability to find insects, especially really cool ones like walking sticks and, uh, and mantises, um, sometimes with ease. <laughs> Reason number 16, uh, seashells. So uh, when I lived in Massachusetts, I wasn't particularly close to the coast, but now I live in Kennebunkport. And I'm you know, about a 10 minute drive to Goose Rocks Beach or Fortunes Rocks Beach in Biddeford. And I enjoy paying attention to the, to the shells when I go to the beach. Uh, what kinds of shells have washed up and, and uh, can I identify some of them? And it it's, can be a bit of a, a fun game to play. Um, to start recognizing the creatures that you're walking on top of sometimes or the, the remnants of them. Uh, of course, many, most of the time, these are, uh, you know, uh, cast ashore shells, not living creatures any longer, um, but beautiful nonetheless. So this one here is a slipper shell. Um, this one here is a horse muscle shell. This can be quite large. You know, three, four, five inches. Uh, a lot of times they'll have uh, the holdfast of a seaweed attached to them. This one didn't. Uh, these here, uh, this is a look at the uh, top side and underside of a common periwinkle. They have this nice sort of rounded opening and contrast that with this guy here, which can often be found uh, near them. Often they're slightly larger. This is a dog winkle, um, an Atlantic dog winkle. And notice instead of a, a totally round opening, they have this little groove at the, at the bottom of the opening. And that, that's how we can tell that it's not a periwinkle, but indeed a dog winkle. And the last one I'll show for shells. Um, this is all part of one reason, <laughs> but of course, there's many, many, many reasons to go outside. Um, this is a, this is a moon moon snail, northern moon snail. Um, uh, quite common around here to see these, and all sorts of different sizes. Some quite small, but they can be really good size. Uh, Maybe I haven't seen one quite as big as a baseball, but uh, certainly golf ball and, and, and larger. Reason number 17. So this was in my yard uh, this spring. Um, I was paying attention to bracken ferns that day, which is where I found this creature, or maybe Jenny found him, I have to admit. Um, but in any case, <laughs> Uh, this bracken fern was still in the process of unfurling, and it it it, uh, it just looked like it was holding this crab spider. Um, this crab spider just they're uh, often called the goldenrod crab spider because often they will be found on goldenrods. But they, you can find them on all sorts of flowers, and in this case, not a flower, uh, perhaps mimicking a flower or trying to to be a flower. I don't know, but it was hanging out in this. A bracken fern and I, I believe we went back the next day and he was still hanging out there and for spent a couple of days on this uh, uh, bracken fern I'm not sure uh, if he found some food or if he was well fed when he went and hung out there but pretty amazing creature and what's really cool about these goldenrod crab spiders is they can change colors so in certain situations they can be white and uh, and of course, this is another example where he's not on a flower, but um, often they'll be near or on flowers, like in this case. And 
you sort of get the idea that this one sort of works, but you know, he's white, but at least that, that pink really blends in here with this echinacea that, that he was hanging out on. Actually, I should say she, um, all these, these large crab spiders are all the females. The males are actually, I don't think I've ever seen one, but they're, the males are quite small um, and easy to miss. Um, the females, they're not huge, but they're, they're quite a bit um, larger than the males. And here's, here's one that I found on uh, common yarrow. And he had, I don't know how they do it, but he had captured this moth and presumably was in the, I don't know, in the process of, of poisoning it and uh, probably going to have quite a feast um, if some other creature didn't come across, come along and, and, and steal it. Um, but this crab spider was perhaps the only one I've shown that was, you know, fairly camouflaged on this white, on the white flowers of common yarrow. So look for those crab spiders. Reason number 18, cedar wax wings. So certainly one of my favorite birds of all time, uh, cedar wax wings. Um, I do a lot of my birding by ear and, uh, Ever since I first um, was introduced to cedar waxwings, I loved the sounds that they make. Um, and I can't mimic them, but it's this buzzy, high pitch sound that no matter where I am, when I hear it, I just, I'm immediately, um, you know, pulled into the moment. And, uh, you know, if you're with me and we're walking somewhere and I hear cedar waxwings, like I just, everything stops and I'm like, oh, there's waxwings. <laughs> and um, of course this time, if it happens to be August or September, um, I often want to know what are they doing? Um, because cedar waxwings eat a lot of fruit. And often this time of year, if, if you find cedar waxwings, if you're, if you're near cedar waxwings, you're probably near some kind of ripe fruit. Um, so they can they can often take you to some tasty treat. Not that all the fruit they eat is edible for humans, but some of it is. And as we'll see soon enough. But here's uh, here's a picture of them. Even in the winter time, uh, these are some uh, crab apples, some persisting crab apples of so some planted trees. Actually, I used to work at a college, um, and lots of planted crab apple trees in the parking lot and that would attract wax wings in the winter. Um, you know, um, I might not hear a wax wing for a couple months, you know, like November, December is like, where are the wax wings? January, where are the wax wings? I don't know. And then all of a sudden one day in February, I, you know, I go out on my lunch break for a quick walk or something and there's just wax wings feasting on these crab apples. So, um, really fascinating bird. They, they rove around, they move around in these roving bands in the winter time, just looking for fruit and um, fascinating to find them. Here's a look at, at a young uh, cedar waxwing. This one may be a bit curious. I was, I think I took this picture through a uh, chain link fence, if I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he's perched on a, on a rose, um, uh, a rose bush. And they, you know, they, this guy was getting on in age. So he's starting to lose the, the, the chest streaks that the, the, the juveniles have and his face patterns starting to come in, but you can tell he's got a, he's a little disheveled. He's molting and he's getting his, his adult looking chest is coming in um, and already has the nice tail feathers with the yellow edging. Just a, a fantastic, a fantastic bird. Reason number 19, black cherry. Um, so in late August, early September, cedar wax wings may very well lead you to black cherry trees. Um, black cherries are a really important food source for a lot of creatures, and not the least of which, uh, certainly cedar wax wings, but also, um, well, quite possibly coyotes, uh, certainly foxes, certainly mice. Uh, Mice like to eat the, the seeds of the black cherry, but maybe also the flesh. Um, there's a lot of creatures, including humans, that enjoy eating the fruit. Um, 
And if you've never tried a black cherry, I would encourage you to, you know, learn how to properly identify them or find someone who knows how to do that. Um, and uh, give them a try. Now, they're not going to taste like, uh, you know, uh, Washington State uh, cherries that you buy at Hannaford. Uh, but they are so rich in um, dark pigments. They're so rich in uh, powerful antioxidants. And some of them can be quite tasty. Now, you, might, you may find some trees that are a bit too bitter for your palate. Um, but if you if you test around, you know you look around, and you of course make sure you're you're finding fruit that's fully ripe. Sometimes uh, an off flavor is is not a sign that the fruit's bad, but just that it's not ready yet. Um, but if you find some that happens to be ready um, and plump and juicy, I find black cherries can be quite good. Um, so I encourage you to be on the lookout for black cherries. They're ripe or ripening as we speak. And the, the wax wings know where to find them. In the winter time, this is a this is what black cherry uh, stem looks like. I just a little twig. I just thought I'd share that. Neat looking. Reason number 20 is chicken of the woods. Um, many of us perhaps have at least heard of this mushroom. Uh, a lot of people also call it uh, just chicken mushroom um, because there is another mushroom called hen of the woods. And so rather than confuse them, I, I decided to, <laughs> to leave it chicken of the woods, but uh, some people avoid that for that confusing reason. But in any case, um, it's uh, Latiporus sulfurius, I believe, um, chicken of the woods. Um, it's, you know, a fantastic, um, fantastically orange tree mushroom. And sometimes, like in this case here, uh, will fruit with ridiculous abundance on a particular tree. Now, I didn't actually eat any of these. Uh, I was sort of in the, my beginning stages of learning about mushrooms. And I, I recommend if you're a beginner uh, that, you know, maybe you just pay attention to mushrooms, where they're growing, uh, when you see them, start learning their characteristics. But uh, don't worry so much about how to prepare them and eat them just yet and leave that to, uh, to the experts um, who have more experience. Um, but, you know, you have to start somewhere. And if we start recognizing them, maybe someday we can start in incorporating them into our diets. Um, here's, here's a uh, much smaller uh, example that I found just on, on a dead stump of a tree. So sometimes they'll just be on a stump or on a, on a, a down tree. Um, but this bright orange and the, the pore surface on the underside is going to be a, a nice yellow. And again, another mushroom that doesn't have gills, but instead has just a, a pore surface that very small, fine holes on the underside. So no ribbed gills like an oyster mushroom or like a, you know, like a, a button mushroom from the supermarket. Um, and uh, not everyone agrees uh, not everyone can eat this mushroom. Uh, some people, there are some people that this mushroom disagrees with. Um, so be aware of that, but worth your study and worth learning about and, and sampling perhaps in the future if you, uh, if you are so inclined. This one happened to be growing right amongst the plant that you might recognize. This is Eastern Spicy Wintergreen. And it looks like there was actually some of it was growing right through <laughs> uh, the mushroom sort of enveloped some of the uh, wintergreen. Uh, it's amazing what mushrooms, I think sometimes mushrooms grow uh, so fast, they just, it doesn't matter if there's something in their way, they just grow right around it. So that was a, a case of that here. And we're getting close to the end here. Reason number 21. Uh, widow skimmers. So I, I could have also maybe labeled this dragonflies, but I figured in this case, I'll show you a particular one that I actually can identify because the lichens, 
I don't really know what they're called. The liverworts, good luck. But dragonflies, well, okay, with a lot of them, it's also good luck. But with some of them, like, like this one here, and like with many of the so-called skimmers, um, they're actually possible to identify, sometimes even with the naked eye. Uh, but, you know, having a, a zoom camera or a pair of binoculars can aid in identifying these guys. Um, this one's fairly straightforward. Uh, this is a male widow skimmer. It's got the, the dark base of the wings with the sort of nice frosty white edging uh, sort of in the middle of the wing and then the, the clear part of the wing on the on the outer parts just with that dark, I think it's called a stigma, that, that little black edge uh, spot on the wings. And the male has this uh, blue or white um, body and this is a uh, you know, somewhat similar pattern of the wings, but without the, the white accents sort of in the mid wing, this is a female, um, I believe, based on the terminal appendages. Uh, the immature males uh, look fairly similar, but I believe this is a female widow skimmer. And here's another look at a male from above. And you can see that nice pattern on the wings. And, you know, so there's quite a few skimmers that have fairly diagnostic wing pattern or combination between their head pattern and their body pattern or, the, uh, and so they can be learned. Uh, so, you know, keep an eye out around pond edges, um, slow moving streams, lakes, um, some in fields. Um, you know, there are, there are some dragonflies that can be quite tricky to identify. Sometimes you can, you can only say, well, I don't know, it's one of these, but I don't know which one. Um, but the skimmers, you can, often, you can often get them right down to a particular species, which can be satisfying when you enjoy putting a name to an individual that you encounter. Reason number 22, um, red sand spurry. So this is a plant, a very small plant, one that undoubtedly you've stepped on without knowing. Um, we all have. Um, in fact, I did it all the time because this plant um, used to grow in my driveway. Well, in fact, it still does. Um, but in my the my driveway of my former home um, was just covered in red sandsbury. And this plant is really, really, really tiny. These flowers maybe I don't know eighth to a quarter of an inch wide. Um, Let's, this one deserves the closer look. So um, here's a shot of the leaves. Now these are, are really tiny leaves. We're talking like half inch, maybe an inch. And these fine little spines, uh, spine tips, just really delicate leaves. And of course they're in amongst the sand and there's some stickiness on, on the plant, which means that there's often sand stuck to it. And perhaps that's where the sand spurry comes in. Here's a beautiful close-up of the flowers. And again, these are just really tiny. So having uh, the ability to photograph them and blow it up um, is uh, really worthwhile because they're just beautiful. And here's just one individual flower and then a bud behind it. You can see all those sticky hairs with sand on them. Um, red sand spurry. Um, for for years, I've had an, sort of uh, been somewhat fascinated by tiny flowers, and this is this is one of the tiniest. Um, of course, there are others, um, and if you go to my website joshvector.com um, and you do a search for tiny flowers, you'll see uh, several others that I've profiled over the years. Um, but I thought before we got to reason number 23, I wanted to provide uh, reason number uh, one or something of uh, maybe a reason not to go outside uh, or a reason when you can't get outside is uh, to visit my website, uh, joshvector.com. Uh, perhaps uh, those times when you can't get outside, um, but you, you want some inspiration 
or uh, yeah, you just want to collect some more search images so you can improve your ability to recognize your neighbors. Um, and I have many uh, free resources on my website in terms of, uh, I have a wild edibles monthly guide that will help you um, sort of key in on what plants might be available for harvesting at any given time of the year. Um, I also have a, a listing of uh, books I recommend and different links to websites that I think are fascinating. And you can also check out when I uh, might have a public event, like a walk or a talk like this one that I'm giving and et cetera, et cetera. So you can browse around. Over the years, I've, I've profiled many, many birds and edible plants and trees and just kind of whatever I've been interested at the time, um, dragonflies, butterflies, uh, insects. And, uh, you know, for the last uh, year or so, I'm not sure it's been quite a year, um, I've been working on this series of doing 237 reasons to go outside. And for some reason, I decided I would go in reverse order. So instead of, sets, instead of starting with reason number one and going up to 237, I'm doing it in reverse. So um, I started with reason 237 and I'm up to 155. So we're making progress. Uh, I think it'll be another, at least another year, I would think, um, before we reach uh, reason number one. Um, and I'm not sure what that'll be when we get there, but we're going to see a lot of cool reasons along the way. Um, this most recent one um, is a very tiny butterfly called a least skipper um, that I found uh, visiting the flowers of fall dandelion, which is a, a different flower than the common dandelion that we're so familiar with in the springtime that can also flower in the fall, but this is a different flower uh, specifically called fall dandelion. Um, anyway, so check on my website. Now back to the final reason. And we're right about on time here. It's 7.57 according to my, uh, my timepiece. Reason number 23, gray tree frogs. I mean, do I need to say anything? I mean, this guy is amazing. So just take that in. I mean, it's such a cool creature. Um, over the years, I've been lucky enough to see them in some odd places. Uh, this is one that was just hanging out on a fence post one day. And <laughs> just, I just love the expression uh, of this tree frog. And, and one thing, you know, if you're probably drawn to it already, but take a look at this tree frog's eye. I mean, his eye is camouflaged. It's just amazing. Um, one of the identifying characteristics of the gray tree frog is often they'll have that light or white or yellow light spot right below the eye. So that's something to, to look for. Um, but these guys are just masters of camouflage. They can come in a lot of different colors, similar to the, to the crab spiders. Um, they have the ability to, to, to even change their coloration. So in certain settings, they can be um, lighter to blend in with the bark of a tree, or they can be darker to blend in with the bark of a different tree. Um, and this guy blended in fairly well with this uh, fence post, but I was able to spot him just because of his shape, I think. Um, but tree frogs, of course, spend a lot of time in the trees, um, and they have just these really amazing suction cup uh, like toes uh, that they can use to just climb on any such surface. It's, they're quite phenomenal. So great tree frog. And I, I should say that um, this afternoon there was one talking um, uh, very briefly outside my house. And uh, great tree frogs are, are uh, a frog that, a tree frog that you should uh, learn to recognize by sound because uh, especially for those of us who pay attention to birds quite a bit and, and, are, and are doing a lot of birding by ear, this is a, a creature that you'll often hear. And I know uh, many a birder and myself included who for quite a while um, thought it was a bird um, and then realized that I was hearing tree frogs. So it's one uh, 
that can stump some people, but they're, they're, they're here, they're among us in the trees and uh, often we don't see them, but they're there. And, uh, and every, every so often you get, you get to see one up close. So I hope you get to see some as well. So now we can move to questions and I can uh, stop sharing my screen. Let's see if I can do that. Hey, does this microphone work for folks? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, look at that. Hey, everybody, look at me. I got an old timey <laughs> radio man's microphone here, but at least um, Very nice. the audio works. Um, so thanks. This is, this is Nick Lund here from Maine Audubon. Um, uh, just jumping in to, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank Josh for that fascinating presentation. I want to run outside and somehow illuminate the, <laughs> the area around me so I can see all that stuff. Um, folks, if you do have questions for Josh, um, uh, as Bill said up front, there is a Q&A box down below uh, uh, along the bottom line there. Um, please throw those questions into there and then we can um, take them from there. Uh, and while you are uh, getting those questions ready, um, I have some questions myself for Josh. Um, do you, you have a blog, which is a fascinating resource. Uh, thank you. Do you also have any other suggestions for blogs or podcasts about natural history uh, for folks out there? Yeah. So, I mean, of course you can spend endlessly spend time on the internet looking for such things. Um, but there's a few that I, that I think are, are really worth looking at. Um, one uh, podcast that comes to mind, it's very short. I think it's five minutes. It comes out once a week um, by uh, Hazel Stark and Joe Horn. It's called The Nature of Phenology. Um, and I recommend checking that out. Um, as far as a blog, uh, if you're not already uh, paying attention to uh, this person here who wrote these two books, um, Mary Holland, um, she wrote, she writes a blog, um, Naturally Curious, and she has two books, Naturally Curious and Naturally Curious Day by Day. Um, just fantastic books, just filled with amazing search images. Um, and she is, uh, unlike me, a sort of amateur photographer, she's way more of a serious photographer with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, an amazing, uh, you know, setup uh, and uh, probably a lot more money invested. But uh, she, and, and just amazing skill and her ability to get close to mammals and hmm. all sorts of other creatures that you know i uh i haven't spent time learning how to how to get close to i, I tend to stick to stick to the easier creatures the you know the the, the creatures without legs uh, uh although you know i've ventured into into birds quite a bit but um otherwise you know it's easier to get to get to know trees and plants and and, and mushrooms because they don't walk away from you but um but anyway yes uh mary holland uh, amazing um uh, blog and books and hmm. worth uh, worth checking out for sure. Um, I, the only other one I would mention because it's super local and you guys already know about him perhaps through the uh, York County Audubon um, because he's done some presentations and that's Dan Gardoki who's um, started doing uh, some YouTube uh, short YouTube videos uh, featuring uh, learn your bird, learn your birds or something like that. Uh, I would encourage you to check those out. Very cool videos. Um, and he uh, is running a business called uh, lead with nature. So check, check him out. Great. And it uh, looks like your video froze for me. Hopefully it's just for me. Are you still there, Josh? Yep. Am I still here? Oh, oh, there he is. Hey, Josh, welcome back. <laughs> All right. Woo. We dodged a bullet. So we, we got a couple of, we got a couple of questions here. Um, let me go first, a quick one, just not to sell yourself too short on the photography because Jim okay. wants to know what type of lens you use for your macro shots. Yeah. Well, uh, pretty much everything I take, uh, uh, I have one camera that pretty much does it all. Um, it's a Canon PowerShot SX60. Uh, it's kind of a bridge camera with a serious zoom lens, um, but it'll also do macro. So it's a, it's a versatile camera. Um, so a Canon PowerShot SX60. 
I used to have the 50 years ago and I think there's a 70 now, but um, it's, a, it's a fairly small package and it allows me to get close to birds and, and close to, you know, tiny little Sandsbury flowers. So it's, a, mm. it, it's pretty cool. Great. And, and maybe you could type that in the chat at some point so we can look back yeah. on it. Um, and so this is, a, this is a great question from Sumner, an eight-year-old in Kenna, Kenna Bunkport. So you may need to take a minute with this. What is your favorite local animal, bird, or fungi that you have seen here? Oh, geez. Impossible. Impo- I'll, I'll let you, you just ask <laughs> it. I could not answer this question. It's too hard. Too many. <laughs> it's too hard. It is. That, that is like a, that is a, that is an unfair question. No. Sumner, <laughs> Sumner while, while Josh thinks, do you have one? Type in the chat if you have a favorite local bird or animal or fungi. Maybe that'll um, spark his imagination. I, I think if I had to pick one just off the top of my head right now, um, you know, for, for, for when I started as, as a naturalist, I was living in Massachusetts. And when I came back to Maine, um, when was it? I don't know, 2012, 2013. Um, when I moved back, um, one of the, the birds that just blew me away was the fact that I was living where Eastern whippoorwills lived. Hmm. And um, we still have some in our woods. And uh, they're a really cool bird to me. Um, so Eastern whippoorwill. And, uh, you know, I, I went back to where I spent most of my time as, as a kid, which isn't far from here, just about two miles away in Biddeford is where I grew up. And um, before my parents sold the house, I went back there and I was staying with them one night and I realized that there were whippoorwills at that house. And, you know, so in my childhood, I'm sure with the windows, we didn't have air conditioning when I was a kid. I'm sure the windows were open and I was hearing whippoorwills probably all night long when I was a kid and I just never knew it. Um, and so now I know it. And so I just think that that's really cool. Um, cool. But I, 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 one other, cause I have to, um, a plant that, that I really love is uh, sweet fern. Um, and again, that goes back to my childhood. That's a, probably the first plant I can remember the smell of and way before I knew its name, way before I knew how to identify it, I can remember the smell of that plant because I used to play on this little hillside where sweet fern grew. Um, and so whenever I uh, brush up against it and, and smell that smell, it just takes me back there. Mm. That's great. Good answers. You did, you did well with a tough question. <laughs> uh, S- Sumner says that white-tailed deer would be their pick because they are so pretty. Mm. Can't argue with that. Indeed. Um, really nice comment from Jaylene and Rich, uh, who said uh, it was really wonderful. And then a question from Kaylee and Grace. Um, how, in your opinion, do you think going outside affects your mental health? Oh, geez. Uh, profoundly, I would say, uh, you know, over the years, it's been at times quite crucial to, to my mental well-being, um, and sometimes the outdoors has pulled me out, pulled me outside. You know, uh, I've written about it on my blog. I think uh, early on that one of the one of the real catalysts for me becoming a birder and spending more time outside in a real dedicated way was a, was a common raven that flew over my house when I was living in Massachusetts, flew over my house three days in a row at basically the exact same time. And I was, I was in bed and it woke me up three days in a row. But on the third day, I was waiting for it because I was like, is this going to happen again? Is this, this guy's routine? I was waiting, you know, looking at my watch and I was awake this time. And when he flew over calling on that third day, I followed him and you know, in some sense, I, I haven't stopped following him. And, you know, that day I, I, you know, I hopped on the bike and went a couple miles and saw this raven eating roadkill and just, you know, just question after question after question came. And I've just sort of been following the trail and it really, really uh, relit my internal fire. Um, and, you know, throughout the years since then, you know, there's times where that fire has gotten dim, but inevitably, 
cedar wax wings fly by or whippoorwills start singing or you know some creature some small flower catches my eye or something and um you know that spark is 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 um you know is back so i mean yeah the natural world is just it's been absolutely crucial to me and 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 i think to to many of us and maybe some sometimes we don't even we don't realize it sometimes till many years later but yeah there's a lot going on out there and they're paying attention to us and we're not always paying attention to them but um you know the, those tree frogs you know they're they're <laughs> they're taking it all in i just love that it's <laughs> great um bill did you have some questions yeah one uh Josh, you, one of your reasons to go outside tonight was the coyote. Yeah. And do you have any information about the growth of their population, uh, of their range? Yeah. Throughout Maine? I mean, they seem to be, the population certainly seems to be growing. Yeah, I, I, I would think so. I, I can't, I don't think I can speak with authority on that, but... Um... But I think partly because wolves are no longer present um, in Maine. Um, well, in some ways you could say they are present because some people refer to the Eastern coyote as, as um, sort of part wolf. Um, it's definitely, a, a, some argue that it's a different mammal than the coyote that's found in some of the Southern US. Uh, it's a larger mammal and there's some sense that sometimes they're working in packs, but um, yeah, I don't know. They're definitely, they're around and you know, they, they're kind of the apex predator aside from humans on this landscape. So um, yeah, they're, there's probably many more of them than we realize. <laughs> Maybe some coyote hunters are, are quite aware of how many there are. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but yeah. And Any last questions from uh, from folks out there? In digital land, how how, how is everything? Will audio seem pretty clear for for everybody? Yes, yeah, excellent. sounded great. Yep, okay. sounded great. Well, well, I had so I had a lot of fun. Thank thank you. And uh, this is great. And uh, my first time giving a Zoom presentation, so I wasn't quite sure how it was going to go without an audience or w with a virtual audience. Is trying to you know, not having a, a face to sort of uh, see if what I'm saying is landing is, is, a, is a little challenging, but, uh, but I think, uh, I think we did all right. <laughs> yeah, you passed the test. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Nick, very much. Greatly appreciate your help. Thanks yes, especially thank to you. Josh. And see you. Check our website for future presentations. Thank you very much. Excellent. Have a good night.